10 Minute Murder contains depictions of actual crimes. What you are about to hear is real and violent in nature. Discretion is advised. This is 10 Minute Murder. Welcome to 10 Minute Murder, the brief and bingeable true crime podcast. My name is Joe, and I'm the host. I'm glad you're here. And as host and creator of this show, I have the task of deciding what gets talked about here. And early on, when I first started doing this, I just did stories that were interesting to me. And the only person listening back then was my sister. And she's too nice to be critical. But now that there are thousands of you listening, I've made a conscious effort to only talk about cases that you all suggest to me. And that way, I know at least one other person wants to hear about it. I tend to like weird stuff, and sometimes that doesn't have mass appeal, which is fine. Not everything is for everyone. But the reason I'm even mentioning all this is, I know, Joe, get to the point. It's because today's story was submitted by me. Not a single soul asked for this one. It's one of those cases that if you had your own podcast, I would message you on Facebook and ask you to cover it. Back in the early 70s, when police detectives, judging by crime shows that I've seen, would dip their fingers in blood and rub them together and say, this is blood. Like, hey bro, you're contaminating the crime scene. We know that's blood. Well, back in the less than modern age of forensic science, they relied on different techniques of crime solving. And that kind of stuff is interesting to me. So today, we're talking about the alphabet murders. In Rochester, New York, between 1971 and 1973, a series of child murders occurred with very interesting detail that connected all of them. On top of the fact that they were all girls, 10 or 11 years old, each victim's first name initial matched their last name initial, like if my name was Joe Jones. And it gets even stranger. The victim's body, after being killed, was dumped in or near a town with that same repeating letter. With that level of attention to detail, planning and follow through, obviously this isn't an impulsive type of murder. This is a sicko that enjoys killing. He makes a game of it. And I say he because women aren't doing this kind of thing. Most women are great planners and organizers and far superior at multitasking. But for the most part, women that are inclined to kill are killing people after an outburst or uncontrollable emotion. That's why, according to research, you rarely see a lady serial killer. Now, obviously, there are exceptions. But in these alphabet murders, details of the killings would not lead investigators to look for a female offender, possibly a male with a connection to social services. At 4.20 p.m. on November 16, 1971, the first child in this story disappeared. 10-year-old Carmen Cologne vanished while coming home from the pharmacy, where her grandmother sent her to pick up a prescription. The store owner told her the prescription had not yet been processed, so she left. She was seen walking out of the store where she got into a parked car. Almost an hour later, people driving along Interstate 490, close to 12 miles from the pharmacy, saw Carmen running, shouting, and waving her arms, naked from the waist down, and fleeing a dark color Ford Pinto that was driving in reverse, attempting to catch up with her. The driver got out and led her back to the car. Two days later, two teenage boys discovered Cologne's partially nude body in a gully not far from Interstate 490 and close to Churchville. Her pants were found a couple weeks later in the same location that motorists last saw her running down the interstate. An autopsy revealed that she had been scratched all over with fingernails, raped, suffered skull and vertebrae fractures, and had been manually strangled to death. The community was outraged that no one that saw Carmen running for her life attempted to help in any way. Local businesses and residents put together a $6,000 reward and put up five huge billboards urging anyone with information to come forward. Carmen Cologne was murdered and found in Churchville. On April 2nd, 1973, 11-year-old Wanda Walkowitz disappeared from the east side of Rochester. She was walking on her way home from the local deli after picking up some items she had been told to go get. A little after 5 p.m. that day was the last time she was seen alive. Neighborhood residents and even classmates of Wanda had noticed her walking just north of Avenue B, struggling to carry the grocery bags. 
A couple even noticed that she was propped up against one of the fences there, trying to regrip one of the bags as to not drop it. While she was doing that, a brown car drove slowly past. The person driving spoke to her. Wanda Walkowitz's body was found the next morning, discarded at the bottom of a hill in Webster, where she had been thrown from the car after being raped and strangled with a belt. Wounds also showed that she aggressively fought back. There were traces of white cat fur found on her. The Walkowitzes didn't have a white cat. Police didn't see a connection to the murder of Carmen Cologne and Wanda Walkowitz, who was found in Webster. On the evening of November 26, 1973, 11-year-old Michelle Manza was reported missing by her mother, Carolyn, after she didn't come home from school. The investigation determined that Michelle was seen by her classmates at about 3.20 p.m. that day, walking alone to a shopping plaza close to her school with the intention of retrieving a purse her mother had left inside a store earlier that day. About 10 minutes later, a witness saw Michelle sitting in the passenger seat of a beige or tan vehicle driving at a high rate of speed on Ackerman Street before turning onto Webster Avenue. According to the witness, the girl was crying. At 5.30 p.m. that same day, a motorist saw a man in a brown car parked along a roadside. He had a flat tire. When the motorist stopped to help out, he saw the man had a little girl by the wrist. When the man saw the motorist, he pushed the girl behind his back and also moved to stand in front of his license plate. He said that the man seemed pretty menacing and not agreeable to help, so he drove off. Two days later, in the town of Macedon, the body of Michelle Manza was discovered face down in a ditch. Just like Wanda before her, she had been raped, beaten, and strangled from behind, this time with a thin rope. There was also white cat fur found on Michelle's body. Michelle Manza was found murdered in Macedon. All three child murders generated intense public outrage and a large amount of publicity. Investigators released to the media a composite drawing of their suspect. They also installed a telephone hotline exclusively devoted to the manhunt for the perpetrator, whom at this point they strongly suspected had committed all three murders. Although these efforts resulted in numerous calls to the public, no credible suspect was located. Investigators interrogated more than 800 potential suspects in relation to the alphabet murders, but this case remains unsolved. Each child came from a poor Catholic family, had few friends, and had recently experienced issues such as bullying or academic performance that was poor at her school. Investigators have not discounted the possibility that the murderer may have been employed by or held knowledge of the practices of a social service agency in his efforts to initiate contact or gain the trust of each victim. Police do have viable suspects, like Miguel Colon, the uncle of the first victim. Weeks before the murder, Miguel bought a brown car when investigators searched his car, they found that it smelled heavily of cleaning solution. Who buys a clean car and then shampoos the heck out of it, including the trunk? Also, according to a friend, two days after the murder of his niece, Miguel said he was leaving the country because he had, quote, done something wrong in Rochester. Police tracked him down but didn't have enough evidence to hold him. He died in 1991 by suicide after he shot and wounded his wife and brother. Dennis Termini, a 25-year-old firefighter, was a serial rapist known as the Garage Rapist. Between 1971 and 1973, he raped 14 teenage girls and owned a brown car. A month after the final alphabet murder, Termini abducted a girl at gunpoint but was seen and pursued by police. The chase ended with him shooting himself in the head. White cat fur was found inside his car, but his DNA didn't match the semen recovered from Wanda's body the only one of the victims that police retain that sort of evidence on. Another suspect is serial killer Kenneth Bianchi, who at the time of the murders worked as an ice cream vendor in Rochester. He is known to have worked at locations close to the first two murder scenes. Bianchi had relocated from Rochester to Los Angeles in January 1976. Between 1977 and 1978, he and his cousin, Angelo Buno Jr., committed the Hillside Strangler murders of 10 girls and young women between the ages of 12 and 28. He has denied any culpability in the alphabet murders. However, while living in Rochester, he is known to have driven a brown car. In April 2011, Joseph Nasso was arrested for the murder of four women in California committed between 1977 and 1994. All of their first and last names begin with the same letter. Nassau had lived in Rochester during the early 70s. DNA testing has confirmed 
Nasso's DNA did not match the semen samples recovered from Wanda. He was sentenced to death for the four California alphabet murders in 2013. As of today, the Rochester police say they are still investigating leads and remain committed to solving the case of the alphabet murders. And that's today's 10 minute murder, the brief and bingeable true crime podcast. Hope you found today's episode interesting. And if you did, please share the show with your friends that you think might be into a podcast like this one. And I didn't mention it like I usually do at the beginning, but subscribe to 10 Minute Murder if you haven't done that already. Rate and review if where you listen gives you that option. And connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you can see the visuals that go along with some of the episodes that we talk about. Now, I know I just corresponded with no fewer than three of you uh, recently, like in the last couple of weeks, where we discussed that the majority of the cases that I cover have a conclusion, meaning it's a case closed, there was a suspect, and they've been found guilty and sentenced. And I probably should have put a trigger warning at the beginning of this one to let you know this is still an open case. It's rare that I do these, but I thought this one was interesting enough to cover. Thank you for listening. Have a good night.